Is it now time for uh, the Sabbath school lesson? I'd like to know if my voice is very clear there. Is it loud and clear? Anybody can hear me? Yes, Pastor. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Esther, for inviting me to review the lesson. We have enough time to review this lesson this Sabbath. And it's been wonderful seeing all of you here right now, uh, composed of several churches, not just Trinity, even uh, Maik, and even from the South. I'd like to see familiar faces, and I'm glad seeing you here the Sabbath day. Uh, for those who are watching this online, live online, it would be a wonderful thing for us to focus on our lesson here. And you can ask some questions at the end of this lesson. I will be giving you questions. Uh, those who are in the breakout rooms, you can ask even more there. Uh, for today's lesson, it's entitled Law and Grace. Uh, this is already Saturday. I think this is lesson seven, right? Is it lesson seven? Or yes, it's lesson seven law and grace and uh the text is found in galatians 2 21 which is really wonderful i do not set aside the grace of god for if righteousness comes through the law then christ died in vain before we pass father more on this lesson and this text i would like to invite all of you to pray with me so we can see this from god's perspective rather than my own let us pray our dear heavenly father we come to your throne of grace, acknowledging that we are humans and our language is faulty and our understanding is finite. We would like to see this from your perspective, oh God. Please cover us by your righteousness and anoint our tongues and our minds be guided by your Holy Spirit so all of us will be able to understand this spiritually since things of spiritual value are to be understood spiritually. Thank you, dear Lord, for answering our prayer that all of us will be blessed with this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's wonderful. Look, if you look at Galatians 2.21 and, and see it from different translations, you'll understand that it is rightly and nicely understood. And I say the New King James Version has the best translation on this text uh, together with NET, you know, a new English translation. It says there, I do not set aside, set aside there like in your King James Version, like prostrate doesn't make sense much on what it means for us today, although it may reflect the original writing, but the original word, the atiteo, reflects means on nullifying or setting aside or not giving importance to it or just like rejecting. So I am not nullifying the grace of God. I do, I do not set aside God's grace. The idea there is an implication is that righteousness is not by not according to, to the law. And here, Paul is expounding the next uh, phrase. But if righteousness could not could come through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So the idea here is more on grace rather than on our righteousness and our obedience uh, to God's law. Well, let me give you a bit of a background. Like these Hebrew, these Hebrews, these uh, OT people, they have this understanding that righteousness equates obedience to the law. You can even read it in Luke uh, chapter one, like uh, Mary there was, was called righteous in the next Comma, and after that is described as being obedient to God's law. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. And I had that in my uh, explanation yesterday in my Bible reading, and I expanded more that I'd be careful because righteousness in the Bible is distinguished between our righteousness and God's righteousness. And so we will know more about it today, what it means for us to be saved by God's grace and how we balance the idea of, of law and grace. Now, I would rather for our purpose of emphasis today, I would have you see visual things on and the slides that I usually borrow from Fostero family. Uh, the, the elder Fostero is the one designing the slides, and I happen to talk with his son that he said, you can use it for God's glory. And it's wonderful. And I added something which and some things are to be corrected based on the biblical idea of what is uh, about this topic. I, I cannot share right here, uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, would be, I would appreciate if I'd be given a chance to, to share my, my slides on screen. Any, anybody can uh, allow me to share it and disable it or enable the sharing so I can share. Okay, uh, anybody, everybody seems to be busy there. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay. So right here, uh, this is it. 
Okay, if you can see right here. Okay, so law and grace. It's a challenge how you balance law and grace. Now, sometimes we don't understand law and grace. Or probably a lot of the OT people didn't understand much about law and grace until Paul expounded more in his writings. But actually, even without Paul, law and grace can be understood. Even without the coming of Christ, yet law and grace can be understood from the perspective of Deuteronomy. That is why this topic in Deuteronomy is very important, how we balance law and grace. Okay, so for the sake of our summary today, uh, since we studied this during the week, let me just give you the summary based on this lesson in here. Look, God created humans as morally free beings who could love him and obey him. I want you to understand it. Underline the word love him. In order to love and obey, we need something more than freedom. Okay? And so we must know the one who we love, and we must understand that it is right and wrong that is to be subject to the law or to the law. And so we, how are grace and law related? You know, uh, it's a challenge for especially those other groups, even, even among us, uh, those other groups who just emphasize one side, one aspect of the law and another aspect. Well, uh, Mrs. White mentions that there are two dangers. One is emphasizing only uh, the, the grace part, you know, without obedience to the law. And the other one is just emphasizing obedience to the law to the point of making it more legalistic without balancing it with the grace of God. So how we balance law and grace is a challenge for many of us. Now, at the second part of this lesson, the middle part, I'll be emphasizing more what is not usually emphasized among 70 Adventist Christians regarding how we, we emphasize grace and we be done away with legalism. Okay, so we can outline this uh, lesson right here, like, uh, for example, law in heaven. We can do like a, a perfect world where it is heaven, law and grace. Uh, we talk about that in law in Deuteronomy and law that benefits us. Like, yeah, we consider litov lack. So this is very, very organized and logical. The grace that redeems us, it means uh, being a slave in, in Egypt. And then... The last one is saved by law. It means it's about how God saved them. It's not because of, of their obedience to God's law, but because, or not even by the righteousness, but because of God's righteousness. Okay, so let me summarize it. Now, the law in a perfect world. Now, you might say, what kind of law is there in heaven? Or you might think, or you might ask, is there such a law in heaven? When I was in, the, in college, or you call it university, I asked one professor because we kept on talking about the, God's commandments and the law. And when I asked him and I said, uh, Pastor, is there such a law in heaven? Because if there is, then the next question is, do you believe this the same commandment is the same thing commandments in heaven? And uh, that, I don't know what, what happened to him that time. And he said, Yes, yes. And I said, how do you apply there the law of, of adultery there? You, because there is no marriage in heaven. And he was asking me, you are so radical, Raleigh. And I could remember him. And when we became classmates in the seminar, I told him, uh, do you remember that question uh, many, 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 many years ago in your class? And I said, uh, I, I cannot remember. But then we went on discussing that there is such a law in heaven may not be exactly as Ten Commandments, but we will read in Ezekiel. This an in, it's it's a, an implication not exactly as explicit as we can see in Ezekiel 28, 15. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. You know, as we know, law, uh, wickedness is only found when there is law. And there, wickedness, as we know, sin is transgression of God's law. And so when there was wickedness found in this who? This individual called Lucifer. It started in the perfect world in heaven. Then it is understood by implication. It, su it suggests that there was already law in heaven. But how exacting or exactly was that law? Is it the same as the Ten Commandments? I, I can say I do not know because I cannot read in the whole Bible that the law in heaven is Ten Commandments, but there is such a law. And our lesson emphasizes the law in heaven is called a moral law. Now, how to derive it in its detail is a challenge for us to talk about that. All right? So, yes. So, Ezekiel mentioned the perfect behavior of Lucifer and his fall into wickedness. He added, you were filled with violence and you were, 
and you sin in verse 16. So he understood that he was sinning against God's law. And so if there was no law, there is no sin. The, since there was sin, there is law. That is the way we understand today. Now, it's added here by this author that laws are needed to evaluate if an action is correct or not. Well, good or bad, fair or unfair, sinful or not. These moral laws, okay? Uh, I, I have to correct the writer of this presentation that he wrote the rules because rules and laws are not the same. I will point that out later on that the rules are like the the lower part of the law and which law is more generic and the rules are like, for example, you can see a lot like there is in every rule, there is an exception. But you don't find in even Google, even millions or thousands of viewers that in every principle, there is an exemption. And God's law in the level of principle is even a lot, even higher in, in to the intent rather than the level of rule. So in here, laws are indeed to evaluate, as we can see. Uh, if an action is correct or not, good or bad, fair or unfair, sinful or not, these moral laws rather than rules establish the standards of, of what should be done and what, what should, shouldn't. All right. Okay. So that's interesting. And now, uh, therefore, there was law in heaven. Oh, look at that, how it's uh, being, you know, uh, concluded. Long before humans existed, yeah, it's from the idea that there was sin, you know, from the proposition since there was, there was a sin, which is a violation of God's law, so there was law in heaven. And that ruled whether a being was irreproachable or sinful. Okay, so that's interesting, right? So God created moral beings and established a moral law that governed them. This law is valid both in heaven and on earth. So if you're asked by anybody, is there a law in heaven? Is it Ten Commandments? Uh, we cannot read explicitly from the Bible that the, the law in heaven is Ten Commandments, but there is such a moral law because there was sin being violated by Lucifer, all right? Because we see in 1 John 3, 4, you know, uh, from its lawlessness here, sin is lawlessness. And actually, another translation is transgression of God's law in King James Version. Okay, then we move on to uh, the next part of it, okay? So we are clear that there is such principles of moral law in in heaven. I will uh, expound more on that principles of the moral law in heaven because it is for us very important how we understand that. For example, in here, okay, this part, uh, I will expand more on law and grace in the second part of Monday, the law in Deuteronomy, in which tell us more about uh, law and grace. Here, take note. Deuteronomy 32, 46. Set your heart in all the words which I identify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful, to observe all the words of this law. Look at that. All the words of this law. What is this law? Well, the context says what kind of law is that? But I will more expand on this later on. But let me just summarize this page on, on this slide here. Uh, it says, Moses speaks in Deuteronomy. I mean, speeches, stressed how necessary obeying, obeying the law, the whole law is. You see that one? It's very emphatic. The obedience is really important. The law is inherent to the covenant. And so when we have this covenant, we take our part. God does his part. He is being faithful of his part of the covenant. We are to be faithful in our part of the covenant. Nevertheless, God didn't say that he would give them the promised plan if they obeyed the law. That is very important to be understood, that the obedience to the law is no guarantee that we will be saved by obeying. He didn't take them out of Egypt because they were obedient. And we will more go into the, the, the next part of this week's lesson and what, which part and what basis why he took them out of Egypt. And so this is what is called an act of grace is called that this is an act of love is called grace grace as we know is something that we don't deserve grace is something that we get something we get for because we don't deserve that is grace we get something for what we deserve that is justice i want you to understand that again let me emphasize uh justice is something we get because we deserve it Grace is something we receive because we don't deserve it. I hope that's clear. Oh, I have made, or probably I have made a mistake in such a stating it. God's grace forgives us for having violated his law. And God's grace enables us to obey his law. That is the idea there. In that, we're going to expound, well, the law is given for us uh, to, you know, in here. 
because uh, God loves us. And as a result of our response of loving him, we obey his, his law. All right. Okay. Look at that. Let me emphasize, observe all the words of the law. You know what happened? The Old Testament people, especially the scribes and the Pharisees and those teaching the law, they were so careful, being careful in observing all the words of the law to the point that they emphasized more on the letter of the law. And then they identified all the command of God from Genesis to the whole, until the, the whole book of Deuteronomy and, and gathered them, okay? And made them into such uh, 613 law, okay? Signet 13, Ms. Wa, <laughs> Ms. Vot, Ms. Wa, Ms. Vot. All right. So what happened? They are, they are, I should say, not outside from the Bible, but they are artificially organized by these uh, teachers of the law to the point that in the Talmud among, among the Jewish, uh, you know, look, look at some of this here. Not to love the missionary. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Number 38, not to stop hating, not to save him. Uh, look at that. There's a lot in not to say. Look, look, look at that. How they emphasize more on that. But if we go to to the last part of, of Deuteronomy, and uh, after giving the Ten Commandments, God said, uh, no more after this. All right, here. The court must not inflict. Okay, here. About the Sabbath, for example. All right, stay near home and within city bounds on the Sabbath. Look at that. <laughs> it's uh, contrary to what Christ did because... Jesus and his disciples we, uh, in the New Testament walked even uh, several times outside. And if we just understand this uh, commandments of gathered by the elders. And every Sabbath is just a home stay Sabbath, you know, <laughs> or within the city bounds. And there is no such thing as an outdoor Sabbath. We understand Jesus and even Mrs. Twice and emphasizing that there is such an indoor Sabbath keeping an outdoor Sabbath, given that we understand that the, the Sabbath here is being obeyed or practiced not just according to the letter of the law, but it is even more of the spirit or the principle of the Sabbath. So I'm just emphasizing here that this is the way they observe God's commandments and, and getting all these, gathering all these commands of God, thinking that they are a part of the commandments of the Ten Commandments of God. Look at that. But if we look at here from the Old Testament perspective, Law actually has this written law and oral law. And so there is such also like Miss Patim Chukim Ido, you know, uh, we read it last week that this law is more on judgment and this one is more on decrees and either you know, testimonials. And they are under a broader category called commandments or Mizvot, but then under Torah. Torah is more of instruction. So we look at these categories, you will see there at least two categories in which there is such general principle of the law which is the law of love, and we will expand more later. And there is such an application like the, 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 the Takanot, uh, Jezerot, and Megahagim. Now, this application is more of a case-to-case -case basis. That is why theologians today think that there is such only two categories. They think there is such apodictic law. Apodictic means the principle that apply to all people at all times, like they're applicable to us today. And, and there is such casuistic, like from the Takanot case law, in which casuistic is a case-to-case -case basis in that it only applies to their time, but it's not applicable at all times. Now, we will see that aspect of the law, and we will understand how we balance law and grace from this perspective, which is not usually emphasized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Here, for example, is the difference between aspects of, of the law. As I emphasize this, apodictic law versus casuistic law. Uh, this is for us to understand uh, balancing between law and grace. There is eternal principle that is apodictic, and there is policy uh, that is also not, although not exactly the same. They, you know, uh, they overlap shading with the casuistic law. So policy keeps on changing over time, you know, while eternal principle does not change over time. Like, for example, the 70 Avenue Church has a lot of policy in the church manual, and we we revise it every five years. That is such that level, a sort of casuistic law. Now, there is such spirit of the law, which is the letter of the law. Did the Jews emphasize more the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law? But Paul emphasized even more uh, the idea or the importance of the spirit of the law. And Jesus' way of, of keeping the law is more the spirit of the law according to the intent of the author rather than in, in this letter. And so here, Christ's righteousness is more of the spirit of the law rather than the pharisaical righteousness, which is more of the letter of the law. And when we understand it, we keep thinking which of the 613 laws that the elders gather together should we apply today. 
But when we understand between casuistic and apodictic law, then we need to understand that we look at the higher principle of the law, the apodictic law, rather than the casuistic. And we tend to think which law among them, even the 613, or not just the Ten Commandments, is casuistic, which law is apodictic. And so it gives us a better understanding how we apply when we keep the Sabbath today or even the Ten Commandments. So in here, Mrs. Sabbath is so clear. And she said, the law given upon Sinai was the enunciation of the principle of love. Look at that. Enunciation of the principle of love, which is the law in heaven. A revelation to earth of the law in heaven. What is the law in heaven? It's the principle of love. It's the law of love. So, so they, we, we're going to make a, a diagram. There is such, the highest law in heaven. This is the principle of love. And then there is such kind of law given to angels. I don't know what was that, but this is just called the principle of love, the law of heaven. And then it was customized in on earth here. It was pronounced. It was spelled out to make it into 10 basic commandments. It was ordained in the land of, media, of a mediator, spoken by him through whose power the hearts of men could be brought into harmony with his principles. Wonderful. So look at this. This is the Torah now. From the law in heaven is the principle of love. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 22 to 37 or 40 that there are two commandments. He was asked, what is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said, love your God with all your heart, with all your, your soul, with all your mind. He quoted it from Deuteronomy 6, 5. And the second great commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And in there, it is actually from Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. And so all these 10 commandments are just manifestations, expressions, explanations, I should say even uh, a, a ramification or I should say expansion of loving God and loving uh, our a human being. And when we understand this, we easily can understand how we balance law and grace from the principle of God's law. Look at this, principle versus policy. As I said already, principle is changes, well, policy or application is changing or rules. Okay, so for example, I'm giving an example of like Sabbath commandment, you know, in their time, as you look in Deuteronomy 31, 14, if you violated the Sabbath, you'd be cut off from among his people. Did you see anybody being cut off in the New Testament during the time of Christ when, when there was, you know, violators? That's why they wanted to, to you know, uh, implicate Christ. You and your disciples violating the Sabbath because they wanted to, to, to kill him, you know? Well, that is the idea that this law was not applicable in the New Testament. Therefore, the application of killing anybody violating the Sabbath is casuistic. Okay, it was applied by the elders their time, but it was not applied in the New Testament, not, nor applied by Jesus. Okay, but in the New Testament, instead of God being, you know, uh, the, the, the direct king and ruler in the Old Testament, Although later when there were some judges in the New Testament, such practice of exercise of God's justice was given to the church. That whatever is, whatever is bound here in, in, on uh, in earth is the one in heaven. And so let us understand. This is what even Father said about the application versus the principle which is changeless. And that application of the law is to be adapted uh, depending on the condition. All right. And so it said, he said here, only the, those who are world servers at heart that act from policy rather than principle in religious things. Okay, look at that. And I want you to understand that, that she even further said, principle, not policy, must control. Because principle means principle of God's law is just principle of love. Those who are controlled by policy rather than by principle are not to be trusted. I am not saying that I am against policy, right? Policy is really good. It's important to, you know, to make sure that everything is regulated according to the vision and mission of some particular church organization. But then when policy is applied or misapplied, not according to the principle, that is the one that makes it wrong. Or even some policies have some loopholes, not exactly consistent according to, to the, the principle of law, then that is the one that we need to be, that it needs to be adjusted. You see, we have to be controlled by principle rather than by policy. So look at that. They will pervert the truth. I mean, those who are more of policy thing, you know, policy, policy, policy without consideration based on the principle. Okay, look at that. Uh, there is such an individual which follows policy based on the principle. And there's another individual which follows policy without the principle. That is the one to be 
to be aware of. Okay, these people who do not follow policy based on principle, they will pervert the truth, conceal facts, and construe words of others to mean to mean that which was never intended. There's a lot of that that Mrs. White really emphasized about principle and policy, and that in there, for example, the principle is also equated with the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. All right. Now we understood that from the writings of Paul in Second uh, Corinthians 36 that uh, the the, here, there's an emphasis between the two, the contrast between the two. Now, and we have a lot to talk about that. The, the letter of the law is the one being emphasized by the, he, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, but the spirit of the law is the one that is emphasized by Christ. We don't have time to go over that. I will just uh, run over the slide because there's another presentation. I will go over, I mean, directly to the intent of our lesson today. So I wanted to find to understand that these aspects of the law give us a better understanding on how we balance between law and grace. A letter of the law, rather than spirit of the law, and even the Isaiah Bible commentary is very emphatic on that, and it 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 is very exhaustive in differentiating between spirit of the law and the letter of the law, and between principle and policy. All right, okay. I'll just go over it for you to see. Maybe you want to take you know a screenshot later on. But just for you to emphasize that these aspects of the law will give us a better understanding that the letter of the law is not as important as the spirit of the law. And Christ, you know, the gospel of Christ has his letter and his spirit. And so we are to follow not just the letter, but more of the spirit of the law. Well, if you're going to understand, Pastor, which is stricter, the, the letter of the law or the spirit of the law? Actually, if our obedience is only to, to the letter of the law, that is the obedience of the scribes of the Pharisees, that is not enough. But if our obedience is according to the spirit of the law, it is even stricter, but it is even more, uh, I should say, uh, it is even more like grace, I should say. It has even, it gives us more grace. It is given us more, more freedom and, and you know, it, it is according to the law of love, which will, uh, that, that love fulfills the law. All right. Okay. So let's go over it and, and uh, see in here, going back to the lesson on the aspect of, of law and grace, that even without the New Testament, we understand that grace is present in the Old Testament and not just in the New Testament. Okay. So that's it. Uh, let me emphasize. Okay, this is the application of the principle of God's law in, in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Like there are two people there. One is going to hell, the other is going to heaven. One is going to hell is, is not even practicing or exercising the principle of the law of love. But then those who are going to heaven, they exercise the principle of love in helping the needy, the sick, and those who are, uh, you know, uh, in prison or anybody in need. And that is very, very, very clear. We have to understand that one. So when we understand and emphasize this, we are actually, you know, uh, uh, helped from being legalistic, you know, because love is the fulfillment of, of, of the law and not unfounded church policy. As I said, I am not against church policy, only unfounded church policy, which I think there is none, <laughs> only some misapplication to it. All right. Okay. Going back to the lesson in here, in that the law of Christ is the one in Matthew 22 and 20, uh, 22, 37 to 40, the greatest commandments, other, other commandments hang on. So there is this aspect of the law that it benefits us. Like, you know, like in Deuteronomy uh, 10, why was the law there? Look, they were saved for what? Uh, why was the law given? For their benefit in verse 13. Little, we call it now lesson, little lack. For, for their benefit, for tov is good, for their good, for their own good, for their benefit. All right? And so actually in here, we summarize the idea that the law is protecting. It's like a fence for our benefit to keep us from sinning, for, to keep us from making mistakes. Mistakes are understandably, uh, you know, pardonable. Uh, deliberate sinning, there are many kinds of sin, let's say deliberate sinning, and intentional sinning, you know, intentional sinning. And when we understand that the law is the one protecting us from that, but again, the law is not safe, does not save us from sinning. So look at this, the Ten Commandments. So you say, so you may prosper. So it's really beneficial. Those who 
don't understand about the importance of the law, the law is very beneficial, okay? Especially if we exercise it from, from, from love, all right? As before we expound more on this, uh, our expression of God's law is because we love God. And he said in, in Jan 14, 15, if you love me, in your King James Version, keep my commandments as if it is by force. And I want you to correct the King James Version because uh, the latest manuscript, I should say the best manuscript, Greek manuscript, and most of the translations today translate, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In, others, in, in other words, loving God results to commandment keeping or commandment keeping is the natural result to loving God. We don't have enough time now. I only have five minutes. Here, the grace that redeems us, it is the grace of Jesus Christ who died on the cross that redeems us. But we can deduce it from Deuteronomy 5.15. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and, and after his arm. Therefore, the Lord your God command you to keep the Sabbath holy. It seems like it is Im imposed, right? But if rightly understood, uh, commandment keeping is the result of our response to God's love to us when we love him, all right? So that is the idea. They were slaves in Egypt in this time, but they were redeemed by God, not because of their righteousness, according to this the Deuteronomy, uh, but because of God's righteousness, okay? All right, okay, let me emphasize more on this aspect, uh, this part, yes, this in here. So, in Deuteronomy 9, we understand that our righteousness is non-sequitur. <laughs> uh, it's not relevant to, as a means to saving ourselves. It is only a protection and is even an expression of our love to him, our faith to him. Okay? Deuteronomy 9, 6, therefore, understood that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. I want you to understand that in this passage in Deuteronomy 9, verses 1 to 6, uh, at least three times, not because of your righteousness, not because of Israel's righteousness, that, I, that you were saved, that, you know, that I give you this law, you were taken out of Egypt, you see? In, in other words, there is nothing in our obedience to the law or our righteousness that really gives us merits to God, you know, uh, uh, that, gives, that, that gives us salvation. Our salvation is dependent on God's grace through our faith alone. And I think that is very emphasized. And in, in his, and his salvation in us is the one which is grace. And I think law and grace here is to be emphasized already clear, right? Even without using the, the definition of Paul and how he reasons out. So it is there in Deuteronomy, right? So when we understand that the law has the aspect of justice and mercy. And we understand that the law is like a two-edged sword. There is justice and grace. There is, if, if we understand that the law is based on the principle of love. And we already understand that love gives us grace. Because it was love that compels God to, I should say, you know, our own terminology, that makes God, that moves God to, to act on the cross and gives his grace to us. For God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son, but whoever he believes in him should not perish but have an everlasting life. That was such grace coming from the expression of love. Let us close this lesson here in two minutes. God loves the sinless angels who do his service and are obedient to all his commands, but he does not give them grace. They have never needed it. For they have never sinned. Grace is an attribute shown to undeserving human beings. Again, let me repeat. Grace is an attribute given to undeserving human beings. I already showed it, that what we receive out of our undeservedness, because we don't deserve, is grace. And what we receive because we deserve that is justice. And if we follow justice, we cannot fulfill the demand of the law because it is very exacting and it's very demanding. We did not seek after it. It was sent in search of us. God rejoices to bestow grace upon all who hunger and thirst for it. Not because we are worthy, but because we are unworthy. Our need is the qualification which gives us the assurance that we shall receive God's, receive the gift. Well,
Thank you so much. And I will appreciate if you ask questions for this to be clarified for us today, because we have a better understanding of the law now from the aspect of principle, which has already grace in it, and from the principle of justice, in which most of the Jews observe God's law according to the letter of the law. When we are going to make it uh, apply it today, up to what point that we should be legalistic? To the point that the principle of love demands it, if it is according to the principle of love. If it is not according to the principle of love, we cannot be legalistic. And I should say, in my own terminology, we better always go back to the principle of love and the Holy Spirit will lead us how to apply his principle of love in specific areas of our lives, especially in our home, in our, in our workplace, in our else. And when we have that principle of love every day, there is nothing to fear of because grace is a part of it, embodied in it, like it is a package of it already. May God bless us. Any question? Thank you. If you have some addition, no subtraction, nor division. I think um, you don't have enough time, Rudy. Okay. Yeah. When so I think uh, if, if we will ask, uh, if someone will ask question, maybe we will entertain one. If okay. there is none, then we can proceed. Okay, no more. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much, Pastor Rolly, uh, Brother Ruben, Brother Edward, and Sister Esther. Thank you for leading our Sabbath School lesson for today. So to end, uh, can we ask again, Pastor Rolly, to pray to end our Sabbath School? Let us pray. Oh, dear God, we thank you so much that your law is not actually solely, I should say, so legalistic that it punishes us according to its demands of justice. But your law is a hedge of protection and there it's based on the principle of love that grace is a part of it. Oh Lord, thank you for such understanding that we now can balance that understanding and believe that because of your grace, Lord, we are saved and not by our own legalistic obedience to God's law, even to the letter of it, even to the rules at the policy level. Thank you for this one. And therefore, idea today may all of us be blessed, especially in the Sabbath school and even until uh, uh, our worship and the rest of the Sabbath today. All we ask, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Rowley. I'm so sorry I forgot that uh, Brother Wilkerson oh, should supposed to be the closing prayer. I'm sorry, Brother. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And please stand by for our... Uh, divine worship so don't go anywhere or you can just go uh, for your personal errands before we will uh, uh, prepare our hearts and mind for the divine service so thank you so much everyone and see you in our divine worship for a few minutes thank you so much <laughs>